You can't stuff your phone in an envelope and call it budgeting. This thing. Uh, hi, I'm Dr. Arlen Myers. I'm president and CEO of this. Uh, I'm Dr. Arlen Myers. This is president and C CEO of the Society of Physician Entrepreneurs, and uh, welcome to this uh, uh, discussion about financial planning. Uh, I don't. Uh, for most of you, uh, if you're a medical student or a resident or early career physician, or for that matter, any stage of your career, uh, financial planning and uh, financial security and planning for the future certainly has become a big issue for a number of reasons. So I'm pleased to uh, present uh, some issues and answers uh, from our uh, guests. Uh, Brian, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Brian Case. Um, Arlen, thanks for, for putting this together. I appreciate it. Um, I run a a company called Direct Wealthcare. Um, it's a relatively new company. Um, although I've been in the wealth management business for 25 years, I decided a couple of years ago to uh, break that mold and uh, work on delivering just unbiased, uncomplicated uh, personal financial planning uh, to physicians. So for 25 years, I served physician families primarily in wealth management and um, developed a real passion for trying to uh, improve the financial capability, especially of young physicians, um, but all of the people that care for us in our society. So um, I'm working with Brock and the team over at Saveology now to uh, to do just that, to bring some great financial planning tools that aren't trying to sell anybody anything, um, just provide education. And um, so, yeah, I could ramble on that forever. But yeah, 25 years in wealth management and, and trying to have an impact on the healthcare community. Great. Thanks a lot for joining us. And you're coming to us from Utah, correct? Yeah, just south of Salt Lake. Great. Uh, Brock, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hey, guys. I'm the head in, head of sales and marketing for Saveology. <clears throat> As Brian mentioned, we're working in conjunction with him to to you know bring to America a, a good financial planning solution for those who are looking to get more info and benefit themselves in terms of knowledge and literacy and and make sure they're taking the right steps for their for their financial lives. So happy to be here and excited to share a little bit about Saveology. Great. Thanks again. And you're coming us too from Utah, right? That's correct. Yep. Great. Um, and uh, so just a couple of housekeeping chores. Um, if you want to put your uh, your LinkedIn profile in the chat so everybody can see who you are and what you do, uh, please feel free to do that. Um, and for the uh, our panelists, it would be useful to put some contact information also. So if people want to learn more, they can get in touch with you. Uh, and if you have a question or you want to, you know, just interrupt, you, something comes up and you say, hey, what about this? Then just raise your hand uh, or just say something in the chat or something. And, and then you can uh, you can ask your question and we'll try to address it. So um, the purpose of this uh, conversation really has to do with a couple of things. One is uh, why are we even talking about this? Uh, two is uh, uh, why, what are the barriers to uh, a, a, re a responsible financial planning uh, and how do we overcome them? And then the third will be sort of the how, like, okay, you got me. I should have been doing this a long time ago. So how do I get started um, without it costing me an arm and a leg? So let's get started with sort of the why. So Brian, why I mean, why in your world, why are we even talking about this? What what's what's changed or what's different or what what's the big deal? Well, like like we were talking about earlier, Arlen, I think um, you know, personal finance has gotten really confusing. And I go all the way back to the days when we could we had cash to cash in our hands, we had a checkbook we could balance, and it was pretty obvious when we were, you know, um where we stood with money and now with everything being digital uh and uh and moving so fast i think you know what i've what i've seen is especially young people are just having a hard time um hard time handling it, hard time even um even even knowing where they stand today and um one of the you know one of the most powerful things i think you can do is just understand where you are today uh, I think a lot of people don't understand that, never mind where they're going or what their goals are, all that kind of stuff. And part of the problem is there's no great tools out there to 
to do that. There's a lot of tools, there's a lot of apps, um, but they all seem to be trying to sell you something. You know, most of the digital banking apps or budgeting apps really are um, taking data um, and trying to aggregate it for you, but then it's advertising based and they're trying to sell you something or um, it's just, just noisy. So I think that's what I'm seeing is it's gone from being pretty simple and pretty basic to really noisy um, and hard to navigate. And then you know, I think the other big trend um, is, you know, companies used to take care of, of their employees, whether it was a, you know, medical practice that spanned a couple of different generations and, and there was some stability, or if it was, you know, a healthcare system that, that had the means to take care of their, their employees, you know, people had pension plans and long-term, you know, long-term kind of, uh, prospects for how they were going to work, live out their career. And now we're kind of at the extreme where everything feels like a gig economy, you know, even nurses in healthcare um, are feel more like a gig gig worker now than it does like a, a career. So I think that that constant movement makes it really hard to do any planning. And what about generational attitudes? Do you think there's a difference in the mindset of Gen Z versus the other gens? Well, there's definitely a difference in the mindset. I think um, those two topics that I just brought up, you know, the less tangible um, feeling of money these days and the um, lack of stability, I think that I think that's more that has that is what I think has an impact more than the than their age or you know just their generation. I think it's the world that that we're all living in because you can see some of those same trends in in other generations i think it's just um more obvious with the younger generation not just because it's huge impact on them but it's also um you know everything is so public these days we're seeing all of this all these problems right um, posted and, right and certainly you know the growth of employed physicians has something to do with it and now, frankly, the opportunities to do side gigs have significantly increased over the years. And a recent survey indicated that about 35 to 40 percent of practicing clinicians have side gigs. Right. Now, some of them are doing it for other reasons other than making money. But my guess is a significant percentage of them are doing it to make money because they're unstable, they're unsecure, blah, 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 blah. So. Um, so, you know, the world has changed, obviously, and that's sort of why we're talking about this. Yeah. Well, I've got an interesting story there, too. Um, so I have a, a back in my my days of wealth management, I have a, a very good friend still, but uh, a couple that were both OB docs. And uh, uh, the wife came to me at one point, it's probably four or five years ago now, came to me and, and said, you know, um, uh, her husband was actually driving Uber on the weekends. Now, these are two you know established obs with uh they have four kids at the time so the last thing he needed to do was go out and drive an uber um and when we I, I finally called him on it and uh, uh it was really interesting to me the reason that he ultimately the reason he was doing it instead of taking you know instead of doing something else take you know taking shifts over the weekend or whatever is it, it, he could turn it on or off and at the end of the day, that was the reason he could he wanted to do that was to have some control over his schedule because he was like most docs getting up in the morning, seeing right. whatever, 30, 40 patients during the day and then on call whenever, you know, his practice needed him to be or whatever that schedule was. And yeah. it was just really interesting to me that what he wanted was control over, yeah. you know, over that decision. Yeah, I, I think people do this for control, meaning and money. Yeah. And and ultimately, I mean, there's other reasons, but that's sort of the, my three big buckets why people kind of do this stuff. And and you don't have to be, you know, the average age of a medical student is 24. So just to put this in context, um, by the time you're finished medical school, you're probably 26, 27. And then you're going to do, you know, pro if you decide to finish medical school and if you decide to do a residency, then you're going to tackle on another four years, three years, four years. So now you're, you know, roughly in your mid early thirties, and then you could do a two or three year fellowship. So now you're in your mid thirties. And so that's what we're looking at. 
and you're going to retire early statistically uh, when when you're at the end of your clinical practice. So, and your clinical practice is going to be limited in terms of the number of years you actually do it. So statistically, there's a lot of challenges in, in these various jungle gym careers. How do you save money for retirement and what's the magic number? And, and we can get into the magic number and how you get there and, you know, the, all that stuff. But so I think that's the, the, those are the sort of why nots. So the why. So so the main why nots. What are the main why nots? Why don't so people. People understand this. I mean, this is no magic. They're reading about it. We're talking about it. They're tuned into this webinar conversation. So why, in fact, don't they do something about it? Well, I mean, for, first of all, I think we have to call it, or I think it's helpful to, to name the problem, like to give it a to give it a term. So in my, my practice, we all always called it the deferred life plan. So these, these docs put their lives on hold in a lot of different ways, not just financially, uh, but socially too. And the way I think about it is they put their heads down and sometime sometime in high school, most of them decided this is the path we're on. They basically had to ignore a lot of other aspects of their life so that they could learn how to take care of us. And then they wake up, like you're saying, in their early 30s and they've deferred their lives and now they have to play catch up. And again, like you said, it's kind of a, even a, pretty finite window where you know a lot of careers like you know i wasn't in med i'm not in medicine so you know i had my first business early on i had jobs early on i wasn't you know i wasn't going down that medical school route so by the time i got married to my wife who's a physician you know i owned a business i had retirement plans i and you know i had all those things that now she had to play catch up or we we got we had to play catch up on and um my point in in bringing it back to that deferred life plan is 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 simply it's 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 daunting to play catch up at the same time that you're busy with this career you just spent 15 years training for and and finding that balance is really hard for people it's really hard to to go from uh studying working you know right. head down to uh yeah. kind of learning how to navigate the rest of this this thing you now have to do. Yeah. So the short answer, I think, is life gets in the way. Yeah. And and the and the second point is that it used to be, like you said, that you could put it on autopilot. I mean, you got a job and you signed up and your employer put stuff in a plan and you sort of forgot about it. Yeah. It got it got deducted before you even saw it. So you didn't even think about it. And then all of a sudden, 20 years later, here's this lump of money that great. But people don't do that. I mean, you don't do that anymore. It's all self-managed and IRAs and Roths and all this other stuff. So I think there's a lot of reasons why people, and they're understandable. I mean, we're not casting dispersions on anybody, but the point is you need to do it. So now we're going to give you, okay. So we've talked about the why, we talked about the why not, and now let's get to the meat of the how. So um, Brock, maybe you can uh, uh, give us some insight into uh so, so how can people do this? Yeah, for sure. Um, would you like me to just run you through? Yeah, why don't you run us okay. through what, what you have in mind? For sure. Uh, before I do that, in the chat, everyone, I am going to put a link to Direct Wealth Care's website. There you can create a free essentials account. It's basically going to give you a $2,000 value, build you a financial plan, uh, assign you action items, give you recommendations and literacy that are going to relate to your specific situation. So I'm going to go ahead. Is it is it free? It is free. Yep, there is an op an option to upgrade for some for some right. additional. You okay, know, but it's it's a but... free it's a freemium model. That is correct. Yep, you do it for free. If you want more stuff, you pay for it. Correct. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And the more the more stuff, frankly, is um is more hands on help. So the tool is meant to be. Uh, user led. So a lot of software out there is a lot of financial planning software out there is meant to support the advisor relationship. And and this is the opposite. This is meant to be able to to start on your own, keep your stuff private, not, you know, not have to develop right. some some relationship just to get started on financial planning. Okay. So money should not be an excuse. Correct. Like, like I don't want to pay for it or whatever. No. 
this is free. So you can yep. do this. Okay, great. Brock, take it away. You got it. <clears throat> so what everyone is looking at right here is when you go to Direct Wealth Care, click on create your free essentials account. You'll land on, on a page like this and be pushed to get started, create an account. So I'm going to run through that process with all of you and show you what that looks like. So we'll just do a quick test account here. And what deliverables you're going to get. Oh, it looks like I got a... Too many demos, huh? Too many demos. <laughs> I'll just do this right here. All right. All right, let's try this. Sorry about this, everyone. <laughs> I went through this yesterday, too. I kept using the same one over and over again. There we go. All right. So once you create an account, you're going to automatically be arriving to your dashboard, <clears throat> which is going to push you to build a financial plan. So if I hit get started, I can start this survey. And this survey is meant to take anywhere from five to 10 minutes it's gonna run you through a series of questions, uh, which I'll go through right now, just to gather some basic information about your life, who you are, your current financial situation, so that our algorithm can put together some deliverables that are gonna help you along your journey, so. And do users have to be worried about cybersecurity? We all have to be worried about it, but I mean, <laughs> what happens to this information? Right, yeah, no, there's there's no worry needed here. Um, we, we do have, <clears throat> uh cybersecurity you know things in place that any you know tech company should have and will have um there's no need to worry here this this information we don't use for any additional reasons there's no there's no revenue making purposes on our end selling your data to anyone else we keep it safe we store it but this is your data the only reason we need the data is so we can help you build right a financial plan improve your life assign you action items things okay. like that. So, and, we, yeah, and no. we've heard a lot, you know, we've heard a lot about artificial intelligence. In fact, that's the only thing we've heard about. Um, so how, how much of this is AI driven? How much of it is augmented? How much of it is guide by the side, et cetera. Give us a little, a little bit about the black box. Yeah, for sure. So none of this is AI driven at the moment. It's all done through our algorithm. So once we take this data that, that you'll give us here in, in this survey, it's going to take all of that, compile it, and then suggest what would be the appropriate next steps for you to improve your situation. Um, make sure you're prepared to reach your goals. And, you, and you'll notice here on this survey, we'll ask you specifically, what are your retirement goals? And that's going to help our algorithm you know, suggest what are the next steps, because we're going to know your age, your zip code, uh, when you want to retire, what kind of lifestyle you want to have in retirement, things like that, so that our algorithm will put that all together make suggestions and build this plan for you, so. Okay, and so what? what is your goal? You know, it used to be, I had a friend that wrote a book called What Is Your Number? And it's like, how much money do I need when I retire? And the old rule of thumb or the heuristic used to be, uh, figure out how much money you want to live on or be able to take out of a plan and multiply it essentially by 25. So let's say, for example, you want to retire at whatever age with $100,000, which is not a lot of money these days, but just for an example, you want $100,000 uh, in living that you're going to take out of the plan. So if you multiply that, you need $2.5 million, assuming you're going to take out 4%. So there's this heuristics of you know, the 4% rule and the 25 rule and the 60-40 rule and all that other stuff. So is, is that still uh, the uh, common wisdom or has that changed? Yeah, that that's, that's certainly what this platform is built on using co common wisdom. I'll actually jump into that a little bit here in the platform. We're, we're building these plans and setting these goals based off of standard assumptions, like you're talking about the 4% rule, how much you will need in retirement to be able to live, let's say you want 100 grand a year, you will need 2 million plus if you want to take out you know, 4% a year and, and not affect greatly your investments. So it is built in a, in a holistic way. Okay. Um, so yeah, definitely. Awesome. Okay. So to continue here, I'll, I'll jump through this entrance survey, 
I'll skim through it. I'm just going to kind of describe what's in here. You guys all have the opportunity to come in here. It's free um, and create an account, see the deliverables. You can go through each one of those questions yourselves, but I'll jump through here. And, and again, feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions or you want me to dive a little deeper in, into why we're gathering this information. So as you can see here, we have five sections, a little progress bar here on the top. This first section, we're just going to ask questions like, how old are you? Do you have any kids? Are you married? What's your zip code? Um, for the most part, that's the only personal identification um, data that we're going to gather there. So if I jump to the next section, then we're going to get into what's your expected annual income. If you selected you have a spouse, then what's their expected gross annual income? On average, how much are you saving monthly into retirement and other accounts? And we'll total that there for you. And then we'll ask you to select what types of retirement accounts do you currently have, or more importantly, not have. <clears throat> then we'll jump into, you know, what, what standard accounts do you have? Checking, savings, HSA, other investments. And depending on what you select there, we're going to ask you to plug in the estimated balances of those accounts. And then we'll ask you some, some a little deeper questions into behavioral uh, type answers. Like how often are you sticking to a budget? Uh, so diff different lifestyle things so we can appropriately suggest next steps. The next section, we focus more on assets and liabilities. So we'll ask you what assets you have, if you have home vehicles and personal property, businesses, other real estate. Again, depending on what you select there, we'll ask for the estimated values of those assets. And then jumping into debts and liabilities. Do you have a mortgage? Do you have an auto loan, student loans, credit cards, or any other liabilities, medical bills, HELOC, personal loans, anything, any anywhere where money is routinely going out, we want to know about it so we can build a plan for you. Um, depending on what you select there, again, we'll dive a little deeper. So if you have a home, do you own it with a mortgage? If so, then what's your monthly mortgage payment? What's your mortgage debt, interest rate? current home value or home value when bought or refinanced. And if you have any questions on, on anything in this, in this survey, we'll have a little bubble there to explain it a little more. Um, and again, we'll go through that for each one of your debts or liabilities here. So I'll jump over to the next section here. Uh, we both focus more on risk management. So what sort of legal documents have you created and kept updated? So wills, trusts, um, anything there so we can identify you know, what you do have and don't have. Then we'll jump into what insurance coverages do you have and how much life insurance coverage do you or your spouse have and your spouse have, I should say. The last section, we're just going to ask three questions. How do you feel about your health overall? At what age would you like to retire? And what kind of lifestyle do you want to have come retirement, which is where we're looking for that income replacement from retirement. So we can make that calculation there. So after that is done, we'll jump into the dashboard. In this dashboard, we're going to have an onboarding checklist. This is going to help you navigate the platform, be introduced to it and understand um, what's going on here, everything that's available to you so that you can, you can move through this. So we really have three key deliverables here. We have, if I click on this, my plan button right here, we have a report card, action items, and a financial plan that is generated for you. So I think what I'd like to start with is this report card here. So, so Brock, let me just jump in for a second to answer maybe just two notes that I made. One, um, uh, that, that personally identifiable information, the reason we're collecting that, uh, your, your zip code, um, is so that we have some context around uh, cost of living, right? That's the, the reason for that. It's not to it's not to try to figure out where you live and uh, and and send you anything. Um, and then you'll notice we didn't ask for social security numbers or account numbers or or anything like that. So it's a, but, really is a comfortable way to get started. Yeah, and we should say that this is just a, a, a get started and sort of within the guardrails kind of thing. Because the fact is that if you go to medical school at the University of Colorado in Denver, the likelihood that you're going to do a residency at the University of Colorado in Denver is about 50 to 60%. Yeah. So 40%, you're going to wind up somewhere else where the cost of living 
is less or more. Yeah. A and about 60% of residents, if they finish their residency, wind up practicing where they did their residency. So these things are all variable and, and just, but the point is we're not taking your information or you're not to sell you stuff and to have, right. you know, do all that thing. Right. Well, and another thing you just touched on, I think, and this is really important because going back to especially young people doing planning, financial planning is not, it's not an event. It's a process. So this is, this is meant to be an ongoing process, um, which is why I think the tools need to be, simple, accessible, you know, not expensive. Uh, this is something you should be revisiting anytime your situation changes or anytime you've got any questions. So, yeah. So it's, it's adaptable. Uh, it's adaptable. Right. Yeah, you know, it's, it's you know, it's, yeah, you know, it's going to change. Life's going to get in the way. So you just need to be able to figure it out. Yep. Okay. Definitely. Um, so jumping back in here, <clears throat> On this report card, this this one of one of our key deliverables here is going to give you a real quick look at your finances, how they're looking. And again, uh, as Brian mentioned, we're pulling this data from the survey, your zip code, um, your age, just to gather some more information on on cost of living, where you live, as well as what what your lifestyle looks like right now uh, in comparison to your peers. So we can we can provide a report card here. So mm -hmm. as we're looking at this, I'm going to go ahead and unlock these this this is available to everyone we'll give you some unlock tokens there so as i'm going through here i can scroll down and say okay how is this all looking for me i have a a b minus overall mm -hmm. i can scroll down and see okay my savings might not be looking too good right now so i can click right there i have a c minus see why i have that grade i'm only saving seven percent per month click see more details Read a little bit more about savings. Again, see why I have this grade, how I can improve this grade, as well as some, some literacy courses here you can run through that are within the platform to give you, you know, there's a there's a breadth of a lot of knowledge or information, I guess, out there. And, and really it's hard to find what's accurate, what's correct in, in today's time. So that's why we built those literacy courses here in the platform to provide you with a reliable right. source of information you can you can reference. So Right. Along with that, I, I do think it's important to mention that with this platform here, the link I shared over to everyone, you go if you go from Direct Wealth Care, you will get resources specific to your situation. So we, we've added in here um, and can, we'll continue to update this throughout the years to make sure it's it's accurate. Um, you know, financial planning for physicians, six financial mistakes physician, physicians make. So there are resources here that you can, you can you know, explore and, and get a, a better insight into your situation and that are relevant to each category here in your financial plan and your report cards. So those are added in here. As we're as we keep scrolling down, we're going to see related action items. So you're obviously you clicked on savings. You want to improve that. You saw you had a, a lower grade. So we're going to assign action items to you, which I'll, I'll go over here in, in just a second. Um, these are these would just be next steps that should be taken in, in terms of meeting your goals, which which we've gathered some data on. So um, I'll jump to that here in a second. And then before I do that, though, I did want to mention this recommended providers section here at the bottom, which is, again, just some additional resources for you um, that you can click on, you can follow, you can, you can, you know, as you're aiming to improve your financial situation, we'll, we'll have that there for each category. So um, that is the report card. I touched on action items just a little bit. I think something that's also important to mention here is we do have this duress and stress tab here. Now, this duress score is going to be automatically assigned to you based off of your risk factors. So if I take a look quickly here, we can see we have some low risk factors. You owe more on one of your vehicles than it's worth. Some other things here, you pay more than 30% of your incomes towards your mortgage. Some higher risk factors, which are going to give you this duress score here. As you're going through and working through these action items, improving your financial situation, this duress score will improve. Um, so that's a good thing to reference in terms of, you know, we can take a look at our financial wellness, this report card, see where we're at, as well as this duress score. We also have this, this stress uh, module, which you can run through and, and get a feeling for insights into your stress about finances. And that's something I, I would recommend retaking as you're going through the platform just to see how that's affecting you 
Um, just because a, as we know, the, the mind and the body are all connected. And if, if the mind's stressed about something, it's going to affect other parts of your life. So, um, we do have that available to help improve your financial well being. Okay. Let's wrap this up in about one minute. Okay. Last things I'll touch on here are these action items. You can, you can reference and jump through. I definitely recommend everyone create an account and take a look at that as well as this financial plan here, which is going to give you some insights into your current situation what needs work, everything is expandable so we can see what needs to be worked on as well as some retirement projections and different strategies you can take a look at depending on your situation and, and the goals you've set. So just to wrap right. this up real quick, um, last things here, we do have some other additional resources like um, a risk tolerance module, credit review, as well as account aggregation and credit score monitoring uh, along with our literacy. So um, I'll stop there. I'll, I'll wrap it up there. I definitely encourage everyone to to jump in and, and see uh, what's available right. for free. Okay, great. Thanks for doing that. Um, just out of curiosity, uh, why did you do this from an entrepreneurship perspective? I mean, you could, you're a data guy. Your background is in data tech and all that. Yeah, uh, my my background is in is in sales and marketing. Um, a, a big reason for for jumping into this company here was because I, I saw the mission that the founders had and and what they're trying to bring to to America and and make you know I think I think most of Americans nowadays were were struggling with finances. Things are expensive, inflation skyrocketing, and there's not a a lot of resources. There's a lot of resources out there, but it's it's not as available as it should be, especially in terms of getting a financial plan. So if there if there's a way for you to, you know, jump in and get get a, almost a two thousand dollar value for free and and get some advice and a direction, um, that's very important to me, and I think that's very Good. important to to Americans. So great. Well, thanks for doing that. Um, so at the end of the day, this is about behavior change, um, and and what? How do you get people? Well, not get. How do, how do you encourage people to change their behavior? And this happens over and over and over again in, in healthcare, sick care, getting people to do what they're supposed to do, et cetera, et cetera. So um, do you have any thoughts about that? And Jahi, ja ja feel, feel free to chime in because you've had a lot of experience with this. How, what, how do you, well, my first question is, does this work? So in other words, are there any data that indicate that if you do this, what you just described, that you're going to wind up being better off than someone who doesn't? So what's the answer to that question? Do you want me to take it? Or yeah. Jahi, Jahi, Jahi yeah, looks he, like he's, he's forming an right. opinion. Forming yeah. a, any, anybody. Yeah. Yeah. Jahi, go. I'm more than... I'm more than happy to process this out loud. So I, you know, I don't have the answer, but um, I do have a reaction. Uh, first thing that I consider is, is a culture of accountability. Um, that is, we're doing it. We want to do it. It's uh, intrinsic, but it's, you know, it's so much more, um, I guess, accessible when economies of scale call for it, where it's efficient and I have support in in thinking about how this is really impacting um, my personal finances. I know when you, you know, when I sit down, I want to understand not just the tool, but how it's being used by others and the impact it has on others. And um, so that's what I that's the first thing I think is there's the tool and there's how it's being. Uh, used and then there's how it's being perceived. So uh, that's one thing that comes to mind for me. Um, so you're you're a, you're a big community builder. So how much how important? Like misery loves company. I want you know I don't want to feel like I'm alone doing this. I want to talk to everybody else who's struggling. I want to do social media. I want to do communication. I want to do in your case a metaverse. I want to do all kinds of stuff because I'm in the pre-contemplative phase of change and I need to be convinced that this is the right thing for me to do. So what, what are your thoughts about? That? Oh, well, that's a generational question. Um, 
for many millennials, we could say that the that social media has done some harm as it relates to community. That while we feel like we are apart, rather we're separate and we're observing that part. So with the community is real interaction. The challenge becomes in the digital age, what does interaction look like? What does connection look like? And um, for me and the, uh, the service that we're attempting to provide, um, it does begin with not just the tool, but people going through similar struggles, hearing those similar struggles and being able to connect with those sim similar struggles. So it's the why. It's um, For me, it's defining the why before you even get to the what. And, um, you know, there's this beautiful proverb. What does it go? It's an Ethiopian proverb. When, when spiders connect, um, when spiders unite, they can tie down a lion, right? And the lion that we're speaking about is financial wherewithal, um, quality of life. Uh, so I see this tool as a wonderful, wonderful, efficient way um, to... Um, not necessarily just spread that knowledge, but to hold yourself accountable in that. Um, but the tool is the tool. Now it's the why. How are we getting to the why? How are we, you know, what is the impact of this tool? And uh, for me, it's it's solving. It's a, <laughs> a generational solution that's needed. How are we pulling people away from their computer for the most part? and connecting them to, to life, to the humanity, to the humanism in why we're doing this. So that, right. those are the things that come to mind for me. Okay, Thank, thanks for that. So Brian, you. you wanna give us your two cents? Yeah, my, my two cents is it's exactly why we're doing this webinar. So the reason uh, you and I started talking about this, I don't know, is it a year ago or so? Yeah. Maybe, yeah. maybe a little bit more um, is, you know, we there's organizations like SOAP um, that have identified that the people in their community um, need tools like this, need to think like this, need resources like we're talking about. Um, and uh, by aligning with folks like you, um, we get to provide a trusted way, safe place to have these conversations. It's really hard to do on your own. So I think the, the, the value of communities that are already built around other aspects of healthcare are how uh, we are looking to um, kind of uh, collaborate with or, you know, uh, build trust around so that these, so that the, so, you know, here's the, here's, here's the long story short. What I found when I got out of traditional wealth management is that um, you go into organizations like SOAP, or we're working with uh, the Wellbeing Index, too often personal financial planning, personal financial topics are taboo subjects. People don't want to talk about them. You know, it took me two years to get through to the folks at, at the Wellbeing Index that the biggest point of stress that they're dealing with when we talk about well-being or wellness is the financial stress of their community, of their members. Um, and the resources that are being provided aren't doing it. Um, you know, the, the, the joke is yoga and meditation work a whole lot better, um, when people aren't stressed out about paying their bills. So, yeah. Um, and part of it, yeah. And part of that is, and this is kind of one of my pet peeves is, you know, how come this is, this isn't required information in medical school or just fill in the blank at like P through yeah. 20, like I, it's a gen. I mean, it goes from P through twenty, and, and you know, yep. young people's financial bank. And there's a lots of institutions that are trying to provide financial education to people of all ages, cradle to grave, yep. of all backgrounds. Of all, I mean, this is not just about underrepresented populations. I mean, we're talking about a lot of white folks who still don't have money to retire. Yep. So, why don't we do this? in my world, in medical school, in residency. And that's kind of the reason we're doing this because they don't, but yeah. that's a whole nother story. And we could get into a whole rabbit hole of why that doesn't happen. 
but it doesn't. So, and, and it's unlikely to in the future. Some of the reasons are well, legitimate. Some of it has to do with FERPA rules and access to student information and security and all that other stuff. I get that. But there, there are ways of doing this that you could do the work around and figure it out. But that's that's basically why we do this. Brock, well, do you have, any, do you have no. any... I'm sorry. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, no, I'm sorry to interrupt. I just, you know, the I think one of the biggest, biggest issues is stems from the financial services side of the business. So there's there's gatekeepers on, you know, my side of the business that um, and there's a lot of misaligned incentives. I think that's what um, you know, that's one of the biggest barriers is if you look at retirement plans are a good example, you know, a retirement plan at a big healthcare institution or any any business um, is usually administered by, um, you know, an investment manager. And their incentives are to increase the amount of investment. They, it, they're not, it's not about financial planning. It's not about providing those tools. Um, and it's not that there's not some good people out there doing it. And there's some great tools out there doing it. It's just, there's a lot of distrust because in the, in the past, um, there's been a lot of, um, there's a, a big gap in, uh, in language. So we started talking about this earlier. I don't remember if it was before, before or the, we actually started the, the webinar, but, um, you know, in healthcare, a lot of people put their heads down early on in life and get very educated about how to take care of us, get very well trained on how to take care of us. And they ignore a lot of these other things. And these, other, and then, and then what happens is you end up with this, this, um, this gap in in language. I mean, I really think I hate to call it literacy, but it it, it really is. There's there's it, it's so easy for um, for somebody in financial services to talk over somebody in healthcare using a language they're not they're not familiar with. And what happens is you end up with not only miscommunication but then missed expectations. And you know what I got to see in 25 years of doing this is. As long as as long as I took the time to educate my physician client, um, they were great clients because they could then trust you. We could speak the same language and we could accomplish things together. Um, and I think that's that's what we need to. What I'm looking to do is leverage communities like you've built with Soap or these other communities we're working with, where there's already some trust, and to say, okay, let's build some financial capability um, using these tools. Yeah, you know, there's nothing worse than a reform center. And so I'll, this is like, a, I'll give you my story. Uh, I, and part of the reason that I'm actually doing this is uh, this meaning offering this education is when I was in, pri I was in private practice at a certain point in my career. And, uh, you know, I, I, I was a solo ENT surgeon in a private practice and I figured, well, you know, I need to do something about this and, you know, all the tax spent. And of course, as soon as you do that, all of these service providers descend on you. <laughs> yep. tax people, and, you know, financial planning people, and risk management people and trust in the states and whatever. So, of course, I thought I was the smartest person in the room, like 98 percent of doctors are told when they're in fifth since fifth grade. Yep. And so I got so this person said, you know, I you, you need I, I had a PC at the time. And, uh, you know, all the tax, this is a million years ago, a tax deferred benefits and pension plan things and all that other stuff. Um, uh, fortunately, I was of a mindset because of my upbringing uh, that you needed to save for the future and save for a rainy day. And I'll just leave it at that because just my parents and where they came from and all that, that was their generation. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm going to do that. I get that. Um, so sure enough, I sign up, long story short, for... Uh, a tax deferred section eight investment. Now, most, you don't need to know what that is or what it means. The point is that um, then there, it, it was a tax deferred investment, but then several years later, the whole thing went to hell and I had to do tax recapture. Yeah. So the, the point is I didn't know what the hell I was doing. And, and I, you know, I signed up and, and now I'm <laughs> I'm pretty aware that, okay, I've been burned. First time, shame on me. Um, so that's why I'm, I'm kind of interested in all this business. Um, um, 
So people in the audience, we have one or two people. Do you have any questions or things that uh, you want uh, answered? Um, Jason, are you with us? Jason, so, are you, Jason, are you with us? Okay. Um, so let me ask another question. It didn't, it, uh, so that, uh, Jay's question, and I, I was going to bring this up, but AI just takes, sucks all the oxygen out of the room. <laughs> so, so how much, without going too deeply into this, <laughs> yeah. please, please, in one or two sentences, how much is AI a part of all this? Um, I think it's, I think it's part of the future of what we're, what we're trying to provide for education and tools. Um, but my, my opinion is that it's, it's never going to be trusted by the end user. So what, what AI should be is a tool for people like Brock and I and, people at Saveology to provide um, to provide answer better and quicker answers to people's questions, it shouldn't replace that human right. interaction. Right. If Google, you know, my answer is if if Google Maps tells you to turn right and you know goddamn well you should turn left. Go left. You don't you don't turn right. Right. Well <laughs> you my know, joke is my... so many times. <laughs> And what I found myself saying to clients for years was, was, you know, I'm not in this, and this is important going back to physicians being used to being the smartest people in their room, right? I mean, we want you docs to be the smartest person in your room, but that doesn't make you the smartest person globally. And, and my, my point bringing it up is, you know, Brock and I have seen enough, um, good and bad financial information that when we Google something, we know right from wrong. And that's, you know, I think what AI does is it helps us do that even faster. Like it helps us weed, sort, whatever you want to call it. Right. And what was the answer to the question I asked in terms of the evidence that your platform and platforms like it result in better outcomes? So there's lots of studies out there um, and they're all over the map. I actually put um, uh, an interesting article in the chat from um, I I forget, the, I what the source of it was. It's really interesting. It's a little long. The abstract is worth reading, um, but there's, you know, there's studies in different populations about the effectiveness of these kind of tools and, and financial education. Um, but I think it, it really, it really depends um, it depends on what population we're talking about, right? So the I'm actually on a webinar after that, right after this one uh, study that was just done um, uh, on the impact of personal financial planning on Black women in the United States, and I think they had um, I don't know five thousand people in this study, and um, what what they found is that uh, over fifty percent of the stress. Um, in these in these in these families' lives was was personal financial stress, and um, and there's a big lack of, of accessibility to tools, right? So, right. I think there's you know there's lots of evidence out there that we need more tools and people need it needs to be more accessible. I think the the barrier that we were talking about earlier is that trust issue, right. um, and we need to I think the tools that are the tools in education that are out there really need to be um, not sales tools the end of the day. So I, it didn't answer your question. I think one of the things we're trying to mine, I was just working with the founders last week or the week before of Saveology uh, to try to mine the data out of their five years of experience now in this on this platform to show the progression of people that use the system and the report cards getting better, their stress getting, getting lower. Yeah. So the, the short answer is we don't have that information right now out yeah. of the system. I also wonder whether social contagion is a is a risk factor. So in other words, there was a recent study that looked at uh, uh, social advancement, economic advancement from the lower class to the middle class. And, and why is it that some kids, people, 
adults in a similar circumstance, socioeconomic circumstance, advance and have social mobility, whereas others don't. And what they found was it depended on who the people that you surrounded yourself with. So if, if you lived in a neighborhood where your kid was able to talk to a similar circumstance to a person who was advancing social mobility, they had parents that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that you were more likely to have social mobility than somebody that didn't do that. So I'm wondering whether part of that equation, I probably think it is intuitively, but who knows, is your, your economic literacy, your financial planning literacy is probably deter a determinant of your literacy depends on your friends and who you surround yourself with and who you hang out with social media and the, and the people that you can meet. Do you think that's a reasonable assumption? Yeah, no, I think that's that's not just in like you said, it's not just in finance. It's but socially and in, in general. I think one of the, you know, one of the opportunities and, and one of the opportunities is to create an environment. Well, like they were saying earlier, where we it's a safe place to have those conversations. You know, it's, it, financial topics are such a taboo subject that it's hard to find those people that you can have those conversations with. And I think. Right. Uh, you know, being in a, in a in an environment where you know it's safe to have those conversations, um, right, that is really important. So, Brock, to this point, uh, in your platform, are there opportunities for people to? Okay, I've signed up. I've I've done the thing. I, you're, I'm working on this. Is there an opportunity to then extend this into a community? without being afraid to do so yeah is there a, he, like, huge opportunity yeah yeah so what what do those look like i mean beyond just the slack channel where people aren't really going to tell you what they really think so what what's what's the next step yeah I, I would say there's a few options there so to start with community um it, it's something we've recently chatted about in terms of you know uh let's say direct wealth care users Okay, I, I am a strong believer in the in just what you were saying. The people you surround yourself with, um, I forget what it, what the saying is, but you know right. the you the are five who you people. you are who you surround yourself with. Right, exactly, and and it, no no goal every every goal you don't set you you won't meet right. So, um, definitely being in the platform, surrounding yourself with with people with similar goals for sure. Um, we we've we've definitely started talks in terms of building a community around users. Um, I, I wouldn't say there's anything in place right now, um, but in the future, that is something we are working on and, and making available because I, I think people want to talk with other people that are in the same space, wanting to improve certain aspects of their lives, answer questions. How are you accomplishing this? Yeah. Um, you know, things like that. So it's definitely in the future. Yeah. And probably one last question that we need to wrap this up is why do you think Americans and maybe people in other cultures are so reluctant to talk about money, their own money. You know, they'd rather talk about having a threesome than how much money they have in the bank. Yeah. So what, why do you think that is? It has to be. Uh, bandwidth. Yeah. Say that again. I think uh, capacity and bandwidth. We're a very busy culture. Um, I think... For the most part, we're a step behind and many people feel that way. Right. And many people feel that they don't have the room necessarily to consider the future. So I think that's one challenge. And then another challenge is you look all the way back to how we're educated. We're educated, you know, from K through 12 with basic necessities, basic understanding of what we deemed important in society. Yes. And money is important quality of life in many times and, you know, equates to wealth and we can define wealth, you know, till the cows come home. But the reality is, is we don't speak about it all the way, starting from the young kids. And then you go to college and we talk about physicians and why isn't it a part of the curriculum? Why isn't it a part of 
most curricular sources in college uh, right. beyond the finance world. So that's yeah. those are the things that right. come to mind. Like it's kind of like sex ed. You know, you you can show somebody banana, but you can't get into the nitty gritty. It's the same. <laughs> it's the same th sort of thing about you know, like the psychology of money. Yeah. And I, I just think it's an interesting topic, and and particularly for the ultra the ultra high net worth individuals, it, it's not part of the culture. We don't talk about those things, you know that kind of thing. So anyway, all right. Well, this has been great. Uh, why don't we wrap this up and some final thoughts, Brian? Yeah. So well, I like I like where we're leaving this off because I think we're touching on the on a on a really big issue. <laughs> you know what? Uh, you know what is money to people is a is a is a big issue and and having a common language or like we were saying earlier a common community a safe place to actually talk about it i think is is going to go a long way um one of the organizations that i'm involved in is you know, they put out a book called value creation kid um which you know i think does goes a long way in in starting the right conversation around money you know a lot of people especially right. for me in my practice, we always started with spend, save, and you know, and give to charity. And you know, what do you do when you have the money? I think bringing the conversation back to what money really is is important. Um, and what money really is is a store of value. It's a store of of this whatever value you create. It's a way to store it and exchange it. And I think when you start thinking about it like that, um, it puts a little different context around money and why you know why it's okay to talk about it. Yeah. And the value, I think the value it, the money creates has to be aligned with your personal values. Yeah. And in, in fact, that's, I think, where it starts. And there's, you're familiar with this values deck. And yeah. if everybody, if you're not familiar with it watching this video, you can go online and you can download it for free. But basically, it's a, it's a deck of cards that has values yeah. on the card, like trust yeah. or well, have, whatever, have whatever. Right over here. Yeah. Right. And it's sort of this behavioral finance kind of thing. And basically, you lay out the cards, and you're supposed to do this with a trusted other person, spouse, partner, whatever. And you pick out the top five values that you that you embody and the top five values that you absolutely hate, that you don't have nothing, you don't have anything to do with. Yeah. And then the partner does the same thing, and you figure this out. You arrive at what are your main values. And that's kind of going to drive your investment strategy and, plan and planning mindset moving forward. So it's a good thing to do, and I think it's a good exercise. So, Brock, final comment? No, I, I think this was great. Um, I appreciate your comments, Brian. I, I think you had some, I think everyone here had some some great points just on where we're at. Uh, I think maybe just leave with, you know, my takeaways from this is that we need to talk about money more. We need to put, a, put more focus on our financial lives. Uh, just as we've talked about it, it kind of plays into everything and it's not, not taught as often as it should be. And, and there's a lot to learn. So uh, I think I'll just leave it with that. Yeah. Great. Jai, thanks for joining us. What's your final takeaway? No, thank you. There's um, one thing that was roaming around in my head is culture. And there is a cultural component to how we, to our relationship to money. So um, that's something that would be in the future, an interesting topic to explore. Great. Well, thanks all very much. I hope uh, everybody got something out of this. You know, we're going to put this up on YouTube. We'll put it up on the SOAP YouTube channel so you can uh, download it, take advantage of the opportunity to engage with uh, Saveology. And if you have any uh, further need for services, get in touch with Brian, Brock, uh, or Jai or anybody on this call. And uh, thanks for joining us. And we'll see you next time. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Arlen.